great resource uh, it's going to be for people. But obviously, as a lawyer, I do think about the sort of you know legal implications and how that's going to work, particularly from an employment law perspective. So first of all, just to say that you may come across employees who don't want to return to the workplace, um, who have perhaps got used to being on furlough or working at home. And um, we've already had that. We've had employees saying that uh, I don't feel safe to return. So from a legal point of view, um, the, the law says that it's section, seven, it's section 44 and section 100 of the Employment Rights Act, um, an employee has a right to refuse to attend a workplace if they feel that they're in wording says in serious and imminent danger. So the job of an employer is to make sure that they're providing a workplace that they can demonstrate is a safe place to um, come to work. And if the employee, if the employer has taken all steps to do that and the employee still doesn't want to return to work and it's an irrational fear, then you can actually uh, start talking about disciplinary proceedings or a period of unpaid leave uh, with COVID for some people who um, you, you know, just, just feel that, uh, that they can't return because it's not safe. And there are going to be lots of people like that. But I think in the main, everybody wants to uh, get back to work. So with things like temperature screening, some of the things you need to think about are having a policy in place, first of all. So in the same way as you have a, a drug and alcohol policy in place, if you want to be able to test um, people's drug and alcohol levels, it's a good idea uh, to have a policy that covers off things like consent and what are the consequences of somebody um, being tested, you know, over, over a certain temperature and things like that. And then, of course, there's GDPR um, considerations because you're collecting data. So um, although it's not completely clear how um, what enforcement could take place for any GDPR breach. What we do know is that these sorts of video techniques like um, facial recognition are collecting personal data and in, in some cases sensitive personal data. And GDPR, you're allowed to collect that as long as you can demonstrate there's an exceptional legal reason to do that. And I think you would be able to in, in, in the way that you might use this equipment. So um, what you need to have in place is a privacy notice um, in the same way as you do if you're collecting data, for example, um, with your MailChimp um, newsletters uh, or, or any sort of mailing list. Um, and that privacy notice needs to be uh, tailored to cover uh, the information that you'll be collecting, how you'll be processing that data, how long it will be kept and things like that. And so, you know, we can we can help you with that if um, that were something that you needed to put into place. But apart from that, I think, you know, it's it's a really uh, it's welcome uh, technology, which I'm looking forward to hearing a bit more about. But if we move on to Jason, Jason's going to talk you through the five step plan, I think, and some of the developments, particularly with um, hospitality um, opening up and some of the guidance that the government's given us um, about having a safe place to work. Yeah, thanks, Jay, and um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think the first thing to put probably is to, is to put a, a caveat in place to say that what I'm about to tell you is this week's advice, and next week it could all change because it seems to be um, changing that quickly, doesn't it, at the moment? But um, but we'll certainly do our, our best. Um, I just want to share some some slides with you, um, just to give you a, a, a bit of a, a bit of a roundup, really, in terms of health and safety, and that'll lead us quite nicely on to. Um, the, the technology that we're about to sort of learn about as well. Um, so for, first thing, um, what, what I want to do is um, just really sort of talk about the, um, the, the government guidance through, through COVID-19. And of course, as I'm sure that we all know that, and we've seen you know, on, on TV and in the press, um, the, uh, the level of, of notes and information that seems to be coming out of, of not just Government, but also the health and safety executive as well. It just seems to be reams and reams and reams of it. Um, but let's try and sort of simplify it for a little bit. Um, and and obviously the objective really is to make sure, as, as Jay's already alluded to, that you know the workplaces um, are, are all safe for, for for our colleagues, but but also for our customers as well. Um, <clears throat> five step guide that you may or, or may not be too familiar with. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all. 
those are the five steps there. And this is actually a, a, a poster that um, has to really be downloaded. It's free to download. If you go onto the government website, you're able to download it for free um, and display it within your workplace. So the idea behind this really is twofold. It's, it's, I, it's identifying the five steps and telling your staff that this is the, the steps that you've, you've taken, but also really giving your customers and clients confidence when they come into your workplace that you know you, you try to make it as cozy as you possibly can. So to run through this, the five steps, very, very sort of basic steps with you. The first one is to carry out a COVID-19 risk assessment. And this is probably the, the most important one of, of the five. This is the one that seems to be getting a lot of, of press, a lot of, of airplay and so on on TV and, uh, and other media. Um, so the COVID-19 risk assessment is something that really you need to have documented down. Now, hopefully you may have general risk assessments that you carry out within your workplace already. If you don't, then that's something that Perhaps we can have a discussion with offline if you need some help and support around that. And probably this is a good time to just have a look at your health and safety and just have a, have a sort of a, an overhaul of what you're doing at the moment. Um, the COVID-19 risk assessment is something that ideally you should be doing for your workplace is reopened. If you've already reopened and haven't yet done it, then I'd probably suggest to try and do it as, fair, as quickly as you possibly can. Uh, if you haven't done it, if you if perhaps want to be the um, sectors that are reopening on the 4th of July or thereafter, then you've got the time to be able to, to do this. So it's carrying out a risk assessment in line with the, the guidance that's given from Health and Safety Executive. But more importantly as well, is to share, share your findings with, with your colleagues and, and your staff, just to make them aware and, and, and really to show that duty of care to your employees that you know, you've taken this seriously, um, you've documented down any risks or harms that might be, and you provide a guidance to the staff that you know these need to be carrying out to make sure that they're safe to, to return. Um, this is a, a general sort of risk assessment template, uh, which again you can download this from um, government or gov.co.uk or the Health and Safety Executive website, and that's just a generic one. This particular one is just a small section from the COVID-19 risk assessment template that you could use. Just to really give you an idea as to what you need to be looking for. So, for example, you're identifying what the hazards are within the workplace and who might be harmed. And then the controls that you're going to put in place to ensure that you try to, wherever you reason practicably can, try and try and get rid of the hazard. Um, any additional controls. And also who's going to action it as well. So it doesn't necessarily have to, to, to drop down onto the managing director um, you know, branch managers. You could, you could particularly uh, pass it down to other other members of your staff, um, and just give them tasks and jobs to do uh, to to complete the COVID nineteen risk assessment. So you action the controls required and any additional controls, um, and then just initial it really. So who's done it? When is it done by? Um, and then they can file that away in your health and safety. Folder. I think the, the, the key with something like this is to make sure it, it is done because, as you'll probably sort of see in a few slides' time, that health and safety executive will be checking on businesses that these things have been done and you've got them in place. Um, so that's just a, a, a one page. Your COVID 19 risk assessment doesn't need to be war and peace, it doesn't need to be 60 pages long, as long as you're identifying what the hazards are um, and who might be armed with the controls that you're going to put into place, um, then that's fine. Uh, the second point of the, the government guidance is um, uh, common sense, really. So encouraging people to, to hand wash more, more frequently, using hand sanitizers, um, enhancing sort of cleaning areas. What I would say with something like this is perhaps don't necessarily rely on your office cleaner or whoever cleans your, your workplace. They do a, a very good job. Um, but you can't necessarily rely on them to make sure that everything's done. They'll probably give you the basic clean. Um, but then things like, you know, when staff come into the workplace, um, perhaps it might be an idea to get them into the, the habit of, of you know, uh, of wiping down their workstations, their laptop, their PCs on the morning when they come in. Thinking about things like light switches, uh, door handles, you know, these are the kinds of things that perhaps you might need to think more about that maybe you didn't do 
you know, before COVID-19. Um, working from home is still a biggie, so the advice is, of course, if you can work from home, then, then, then do so. But, but certainly you need to incorporate your, your home base staff within to your risk assessment. Now, I'm not suggesting for women that, you know, you need to go and visit everybody at home and, um, you know, carry out a full risk assessment on them. Um, but perhaps it, it might be good practice and best practice to send the home worker a risk assessment template for them to fill in themselves and send it back to you. So, so make sure you're incorporating the home base staff as well. Um, maintaining of the two metre social distancing. So again, like I said, it's a caveat because that's about to change, isn't it? So I, I kind of put in there that you know the two metre social distancing or, or one metre with with uh, risk mitigation. You can't you can't allow the two metres. That's obviously going to come into play quite a lot for the hospitality sector. So it's still at the moment you know maintaining that two metre distance between people or the one metre as it is now. Um, putting up signs to remind workers and visitors that the social distancing guidance is there, and you can do that with your, your COVID-19 poster that, that we've showed you already. Um, and again, there's sort of things on there that you may or may not do. So we've all been into a local supermarket, and we're now you know, quite used to seeing the signs on the floor. I'm not suggesting that you're, you know, you're an office-based sort of business that you have to do that. But it's thinking about ways that things that might fit into your, your workplace. Um, one way of traffic through the workplace is possible. That would certainly be applicable for hospitality as we're now learning a little bit more about you know, what, what hospitality friends have got to, have got to implement. Um, and managing the risk or the managing transmission really. So if you can't be two metres apart or, or one metre, then it's sort of considering the action that you need to sort of put into place. So uh, I'm not going through all of these, but you can see there, there are certain things that you know, the government have given it as guidance. Again, most workplaces might be able to implement all of them or some of them. You may look at that and think, well, that more particular fit in our workplace. So it's not a, a one hat fits all by any means, but it will certainly give you a, a bit of a flavour in terms of, of what you need to be, be looking at. One thing we're doing at Biomi Law is the staggering arrival and, and, and departures or reducing the, the number of people in teams so you know we're we're working from home and in the office as well some people are in the office on one day some people are in on the other and that might be an easy way to try and to manage that sort of risk if if at all possible i, I realize that not everybody would be able to do that but that's something that's working quite well for us um, just moving on from the five steps just wanted to to bring you up to speed with riddle reporting um, these are new uh, guidelines that have been introduced by the government that you need to be aware of. Um, and these are things that health and safety executive will be, will be wanting you to implement um, should this occur. So uh, uh, an unintended incident at work, so if somebody has possible or actual exposure to coronavirus, then you have to report that through the normal RIDOR channels as a dangerous occurrence. If a member of your staff has been diagnosed with COVID-19 and there is reasonable evidence that, that that has been caused at work, then that also has to be reported. And in the eventuality, or, or I'm sure there's going to be few and far between, but you know, should, should somebody die as a result of exposure to coronavirus, uh, then of course you need to report that as well. So the third one out of those three has always been there. If there has been fatality in the workplace, it needs to be <clears throat> reported through RIDOR, but the top two there are quite new. These are new guidelines that have been introduced through COVID-19. So again, these are perhaps things that you need to update within your health and safety policies. Um, just a, a note on the health and safety executive. Now they are they are carrying out a, a massively increased number of spot checks on, on visitors as and when they, they reopen. Um, They've introduced something called FIFA intervention. The FIFA intervention was introduced a few years back. So this is not a new thing, but you know, certainly people that I speak to, or, or, or certainly very few people that I speak to, are actually aware of it. If you're on your own business, then it's probably just good to touch on this, so you are well aware of it. And, and also, it's showing the importance of making sure that documentation, need to know what in place is in place. If health and safety executives do come and, and uh, spot check your business. It will certainly 
at the moment be particularly looking for evidence that you know COVID-19 safety measures have been put into play. Um, they can charge a fee for their time. Four pounds an hour is not a fine. This is actually just a bill for their time. What they can't do is they can't just rock up to your business and start waving invoices for 150 pounds an hour at you. What they will do is start to look through your documentation. If they then find that there are material breaches, then they will start to charge you a fee for intervention. Um, and, and that could be three, four hours work um, on one day. They may then come back the following week. So again, you've got to be thinking about the financial impact of not doing these things. Um, and they're quite sort of easy things to implement. It means a little bit more work. But A, it's going to keep your staff safe. It's going to keep your customers safe. And also it's going to reduce the risk of, of having um, help the executive coming around to your workplace there's just something to be aware of <clears throat> it's certainly not something to be afraid of um, I, I saw a, <clears throat> um, a piece on LinkedIn this morning where somebody was saying this is going to be the next PPI well it's not oh no, let's not get carried away and let's not sort of scaremonger you know let's keep it into perspective and make sure that <clears throat> if we're putting these things into place then we shouldn't have anything to worry about so just to recap on that, so <clears throat> a few points really to give you. So remember to do the risk assessment to make sure the COVID-19 specific risk assessments are, are carried out and make sure you share that information with the staff. COVID-19 poster, you've probably all got health and safety at work posters up in your workplace somewhere. Just put the COVID-19 poster alongside it, make sure the staff are aware of the content and the five points that we've talked about and make sure you update your, your health and safety policies to include all the new legislation. If you do need some help and support, I'm not going to bang on about this, but we can provide you that support and we can help you with that. <clears throat> so it's a full sort of health and safety support that system that we have through our, through our partner. So if you do need some help and advice on that, then, then please let me know. They're my contact details. If you do need to contact us, but anything related to health and safety that you've seen today that you're not quite sure of, or, or alternatively, if you, you know, equally wanting some information on, on HR employment law, then these are the numbers to, you to get in contact with us. Um, <clears throat> but one part of sort of managing the, the transmission risk uh, and, and looking at ways of how you can do that, and, and as we've already had sort of sight of what we're about to see, then, you know, these sort of products that Hike Vision provide are, are second to none, and it's going to massively help. If you think about the hospitality sector, where you know our, our friends in the hospitality the public are now are going to have to check in and check people out and make sure that you know they, they're, they're safe to come in, then these are easier ways to be able to do it. So I'm going to hand you over to uh, to David from Hike Vision, and he'll take you through the next part of, of the uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Some uh, food for thought there. Let's see if I can share my screen. There we go. Everybody should be able to see those slides now on the screen. Um, so thanks very much for that. Um, my name is David Wood. I'm the business development manager for the South Yorkshire region here at Hike Vision. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to run through a few slides just to introduce you to some of the technology range that we've got available. Um, but just by way of a, a brief introduction, here at Hike Vision, we're one of the global leaders in the manufacture of security products. So it's not just thermal screening devices. We offer the whole host of security devices, CCTV cameras, video storage, the whole length and breadth of the security side of things. But over the last few years, we've spent a lot of time developing our thermal technology. So historically, or still is, still available for perimeter detection. So maybe triggering an alert based on somebody being in a particular area that they shouldn't be, picking up on that body temperature. Monitoring machinery to make sure that that machinery is running at its optimal, temp optimal temperature. Or even fire detection as well. So with a, a few edits and a few changes to, uh, to firmwares, we can now offer a highly accurate thermal temperature screening device. So from that brief intro, you probably figured out for yourselves that these are not COVID-19 detectors. 
basically it's a it's a quick easy and effective way of alerting on the fact if somebody is displaying an elevated temperature yes it could mean that they're uh, they're ill so yeah they'd be running an elevated temperature but also equally they could have just taken part in some vigorous exercise or maybe even been stood out in the sun for too long uh, on a day like this but it is that early warning it's triggering an alert so it's the alerts that we're interested in so with that in mind just a brief video to play you here to show you the technology so on the right hand side there we've got one of our thermal screening devices this is one of the handheld variants and on the left hand side we've got a um, an infrared thermometer so straight away with the thermometer you can see social distancing is kind of out of the window because people have to be really close and on the right hand side i mean it's already finished the screening process people were screening through walking through and it was very quickly taking those temperatures one by one as they went through so a very very quick and easy way to filter through that process. So with that in mind, what I'll do is I'll just introduce you briefly to each piece of technology that we can offer. We really do pretty much have something for every single scenario. So this is one of our, this, this is our fixed camera range. As you can see on the video, people are filtering through the screening process there and the readings are coming out. So the fixed camera, yes, it can be fixed. So it can be a more permanent install bolted to a wall or even a ceiling dependent on the right uh, the right height mounting heights or equally as well on the bottom right hand side there you can see somebody's got one deployed fixed to a tripod so it's a little bit more mobile but you can deploy that as and when necessary so as people walk through that screening process what the camera does is it has an intelligent algorithm built into the device which first of all looks for a human's face so once it's clarified that and the face detection has been done what it will then do is take the temperature screening from the forehead region so on some of these demos, you may see people holding hot coffee cups to the forehead, which is basically a way of just triggering a, a temperature exception to show for demo purposes. Once it's got that, the alarm can be then raised. That could be an audible alarm, which is emitted directly from the camera. Could pre be a pre-recorded message saying temperature exception, or equally, you could upload your own audio file and play your own bespoke message. If you don't want an audio file, what you can do is you can just play a uh, sorry you can you can display a flashing light so a flashing beacon to display that some a temperature exception has been read and it draws you to the fact it could send that information through to our software so that it can display on the software screen to show that that temperature uh, exception has been received or even send an email to a central station or somebody's pc so they can take further action there's a whole load of different ways to report using these devices so with the fixed devices as well, they can take the temperature screen in from up to 30 people in one particular scene. Now we don't recommend 30 people all of a sudden pile in at once because obviously social distancing out of the window, but it's just an example of how um, accurate and how advanced the technology is. So moving on now, as we saw on the previous video briefly, this is one of our handheld devices. So if keeping on the move, um, deploying quickly is key to your operation we can offer a handheld screening device so what this will do is this is battery powered so there's no cables equally it's wi-fi operated as well so again no no cables so you can hold that in your hand as the uh, as the name suggests or if you want to be a little bit more fixed on the right hand side there you can mount that on a tripod style install with the previous cameras up to 30 people within one scene this device will do one at a time but as you can see on this video, that is still a very quick process. As people filter through, the camera quickly locks on to the targets, takes the temperature readings, and processes that information potentially back to an NVR so that information can be stored and referred back to later. The next device, another, another interesting one and a very popular one, in fact, with a dual use as well. So not only will it do the thermal screening uh, using one of our turret style cameras, which is mounted on the top of the archway there to do all the temperature screening process, but it will also act as a metal detector. So exactly like in an airport, as you walk through security, it can also trigger on metal objects. So to show it, give you an example of what that looks like, I've got a brief video for you here. So on the right hand side, as people go through the screening process, the LEDs remain green, everybody's okay. Once it detects someone with the temperature exception, you get a buzz, the lights, the lights turn red, and it, it draws the, uh, the attention to that and they can't go any further. Equally, on the far left-hand side, we've got an example there of it picking up on a metal object. The red LEDs are illuminated in the relevant area. 
and it's detected there he's walking through the process wearing a watch so like i say a dual a dual element to it there also it comes with the lcd screen mounted on the top so you can quickly see the results of how many people have gone through the process and how many temperature exceptions there's been throughout the day next one along again a really popular device now uh, and also again with a dual purpose so not only will it do thermal screening with the temperature exceptions it will also do mask detection so within your offices or retail outlets if you've got a must wear a face mask policy for covid19 what the system will do using facial recognition will determine whether an individual is wearing a mask or not if they're not it will then prompt them to wear one so they can't go any further equally this can be linked into your access control systems as well so rather than using a fob or a scanner to get through the facial record if you're in the facial recognition database it's a nice easy contactless way to gain access to the building so you're not actually touching the screen um, again equally if you're not wearing a mask it won't it won't downpower the maglock it won't let you into the building so what does that look like well it looks exactly like this on this demo video so as the individual approaches he's in the database he's authenticated he can go into the building this young lady is not wearing a mask the system wants her to wear a mask it won't let her in until she's wearing one and then off she goes this guy is running a temperature exception with the hot coffee cup in his forehead abnormal temperature it just will not open the door you can use this standalone as well so you don't have to have it connected to the wall or to a door it can simply sit there as a temperature screening and mass detection device as it is doing there so a really quick nice and easy way to filter everybody through and there we go he approaches with a temperature exception comes up with the red light sorry can't go any further and then the last product on this on this showcase is our density control and, and flow solution so as the rest of them we're using thermal technology and screening this one doesn't but what this does is using our existing people counting cameras this system can couple up with our bespoke software to work on a traffic light system so if you've got a retail outlet or a meeting room or whatever it may be where you only want a certain number of people to be in there at any one time so you can monitor social distancing then this will achieve that for you so on this example video we've got people walking into a store as they go in you can see on the right hand side the counter goes down finally turns red traffic light system no one can go in until people then filter out like they do now the number goes up the light goes green more people can enter so it's a nice simple way of managing that process what we are doing as well is we're about to launch a um, social distancing camera as well so as we get more details on that our partners over at affinity will be happy to uh, provide you with that information but essentially if you're trying to enforce the uh, one meter plus social distancing rule we've got a solution in place that can that can monitor that as well so essentially that's the that's the product range like i say there's quite a lot of information there we can go into a lot more detail with anybody as well if needs be but these are some of the applications and scenarios where we've got our devices installed so obviously hospitals railway offices and schools very popular locations for these devices and just to recap for you there just to go back over some of the uh, the, the unique points of our devices um, so it's our self-developed algorithm as i said using the facial detection and taking the temperature screening from the forehead area negating false alarm so it's not locking into a radiator in the corner of the room or a hot coffee cup out on the side somewhere it is looking for that human body to take the temperature reading embedded audio alarm so that audible alert to say temperature exception so if you've not got somebody sat on a desk monitoring this process 24 hours a day it can be self-policed so if they get if an individual gets that audio message they know they shouldn't go any further or any deeper into the building risking spreading any sort of infection around and again as i said earlier right at the very top one-stop solution we are a global leader in um, cctv products so it's not just the thermal devices we offer a whole host of of units such as the nvr and storage that goes in the background as well so that is pretty much it from me i hope that's been a good overview for you um the only thing left to do really is just throw it open to to any questions i think and pass back over to uh, to rich once i've unmuted myself that'd help um, <laughs> thank, thank you thank you for that guys thank you appreciate it. that was really really interesting uh, jason jay and and dave um i got a few questions first one for jay's from from andy hogg um 
so the way we operate is to deliver IT training on client sites using subcontractors who have signed SLA. Is it our responsibility to ensure the safety of our subcontractors? Sorry, I, I did that. Uh, yeah, so um, Jason might have more to add to this, but yes, uh, in principle, you do. Any visitors, subcontractors, um, clients, uh, anyone coming to your premises, you know, you're responsible for them and uh, you've got to keep those premises safe for them. And if you look on the, um, the government guidance, particularly with COVID, it's separated into eight different sectors. If you have a look at your sector, it gives you ideas on how you would um, protect not only your employees but visitors to your premises from a health and safety perspective. So just to add to that, Jay, if I may, the delivery is actually on our client sites. We don't have training rooms, so is it our client's responsibility to ensure? Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, yes, it is. Um, but. Uh, if you're so you're sending people out we to, are sending you know, contractors to client sites yes yeah so so you should um ask your uh, clients what they've got in place yep to fulfill your obligation so although you don't have to physically go and make that work that that site safe um you should really be asking questions as to what they've got in place and satisfy yourself um that uh, that it's safe and is it any different whether these people we're sending in are full-time employees or subcontractors? It just cut out then. Yeah, Would it, it, is it any different? Because we, do, we don't tend to send in full-time employees. We, we will send in subcontractors who sign service level agreements with us. So are um, our responsibilities there any different? I don't think so, no. Not in terms of um, health and safety, um, because there's no difference between them or an employee going out to um, a site. Your obligations would be slightly different for people coming to your site because yeah. you'd have a higher duty to your employees. Yeah, lovely. Thank you very much. Cool. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Jay. Uh, one, one for Dave, uh, uh, High Vision. Um, can the temperature screening equipment be used outside? No, these, these devices can't be used externally purely because there are too many um, variants in uh, ambient temperature outdoors. They must be used in a suitable indoor environment to keep them away from wind, um, rain, changes in temperatures and things like that. So yeah, they must, they must be used indoors in a more controlled environment. Cool, spot on. Thank you, Dave. Uh, one uh, from Dan Laver for either Jay or, or Jason. Uh, do employees have a right to request certain measures, i.e. to be given PPE, to request dividing screens, etc. Um, yeah, well, yeah. The answer to that, Dan, is absolutely. Yeah, they certainly have got the right to request it. Um, I think, to be honest, I think probably this is where it all starts from from the, the, the risk assessments that you would carry out yourself anyway, because really you should have identified the measures that need to be put in place. So, you know, I, I would probably say staff shouldn't have to be coming up and requesting in place already. But they certainly do have a right to request. And I think the other important point with that as well is um, the HSC are very keen to hear of businesses that aren't providing these safety measures. Um, I think there is a, a, a telephone, direct telephone number on their website for employees who, I don't know, might, might have the inclination to whistleblow for want of a better phrase. I'm sure there's probably employees out there that might do that um, and so you know you don't want to be giving HSE any cause question what you have got in place by employees saying well look my employer is not providing a safe place for me to work so certainly they do have the right to request um, I'd hope that they wouldn't request it because I hope that it would be a good place already and a question for Dave but I think he's probably answered this in his presentation uh, the handheld the smaller handheld scanners I've uh, seen a lot of them being used. Uh, how do they compare to the ones from Height Vision? Um, I think you probably answered that, but I'm sure you might be able to add to that, Dave. Yeah, you saw the short video at, at the beginning there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's using that um, that intelligence and obviously keeping that social distancing. As you saw on the video, people were pretty much on top of one another as the reading was taking place. There are some devices, like ours takes the temperature reading from uh, from the forehead region. There are some devices out there that'll take it from the corner of the eyes. Uh, anybody that's wearing glasses will have to 
have to remove the, the eyewear for the, the temperature screening to take place. Yes, foreheads can be obscured by hats or things like that, but probably not as often. So it's the path of least resistance, really. But um, yeah, I'd, I'd say that's why they're, uh, they're, they're proving really popular over, the, uh, over some of the, the other devices that are out there at the moment. Cool, thank you, Dave. Uh, and the final question I've got um, is for Jay and Jason again. Uh, there's a lot of confusion around furloughed staff at the moment. Can someone who has been furloughed return to part-time work? Uh, and can an or employer, uh, second part of the question, can an employer enforce, enforce and take in holidays? Yeah, I'll take that. Um, so first of all, on holidays, yes, you can um, insist that an employee takes some of their holidays um, during furlough or even not, not necessarily during furlough, but you can as general practice anyway. Uh, but the rule is that you have to give them twice as much notice as the holiday you want them to take. If you want them to take a week's holiday, um, you know, that a week of their holiday allowance, then you give them two weeks notice. The other thing on holidays, I'd just say is that if you um, ask employees to take holidays during furlough, then um, it's a good idea to do that, partly so that you're not having employees with loads of holidays left at the end of the year. Uh, but also at the moment, while the furlough grant is available, you'll be able to recover a portion of that so you have to top up the holidays to 100 percent of salary but you'll be able to get 80 percent as it is currently and then gradually that will be reducing down the other question was about part-time um, working so from the first of july i think it's uh, brilliant that uh, employers can still use the furlough scheme but more flexibly so from the first of july you can get employees to come back part of the time and still use the furlough scheme for the time that they're not working. So I think that will add a lot of flexibility for employers. Cool, thank you, Jay. I think that's it for questions. Why? Unless anybody's uh, got one, and if they want to unmute themselves and ask it, uh, feel uh, go for it now. No, okay. I'll, uh, I'll hand back to Colin then. I'll let him uh, finish up. Thanks everybody. Uh, I just want to say a big thank you for all of you for attending and also to Jay, Jason and David for, uh, well, I think everybody will agree, what really interesting content. I'd be astounded if, uh, if uh, everybody's not walking away with at least uh, one bit of information, one point that, uh, that's new to them. So uh, thanks again. Um, best to look with everybody with the uh, transition back to, the, to this normal. Uh, yeah, if you'd like further advice from ourselves or from any other presenters, um, just get in touch and we'll, uh, and we'll pass you on. Thanks. And, Thanks and just to add to that, we'll be following up um, with an email uh, with the feedback form on uh, where you can request more information. And we'll also put uh, a, the link to the actual recording of this as well. Um, uh, so you can have a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Thanks, guys.